Okay, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our discussion uh, this evening. My name is uh, Kevin Featherstone, and I'm director of the Hellenic Observatory here at the LSC. Uh, tonight's discussion, of course, is confronting a particular issue, but a set of issues uh, that have been in the public realm for many years. The return of the Parthenon on Elgin marbles has long been debated and has long been sought uh, by Greece. Indeed, perhaps few other cases have been more intensely debated and for so long. But the arguments, of course, have widened in recent years, uh, raised to a more generic level uh, with campaigns for the decolonialization of treasures removed from their original locations. Who has rights over such treasures? Should they be seen as part of a national or ethnic identity or as a global heritage um, in which uh, we share a common um, sense of civilization? Now, here at the Hellenic Observatory, we have sought for a number of years to have a discussion on this particular uh, topic both the wider issues and the specific case of the um, Parthenon marbles. But we've faced some constraints, to be frank. The LSE, of course, wishes to have all views uh, represented in such discussions. And I must say, over the years, we have uh, gone to great efforts uh, to invite representatives of all shades of opinion, uh, to invite current, past, deputy and directors of the British Museum, and we have been unsuccessful in uh, being able to welcome them uh, to a discussion uh, such as this. And if I could just go one step further on that theme, let's say that I'm somewhat puzzled uh, by the lack of willingness of a public institution uh, to see itself accountable to an academic audience such as that at the LSE. So this evening, we're not having a debate. We're looking at issues from um, the perspective of different uh, types of expertise, different experiences, different expertise that can be brought to bear to the topic. So we're going to explore the particular issue for the Parthenon Marbles, as well as the more uh, wide generic uh, issues. Uh, and the discussion, as I say, is not a debate, despite the fact that you look as if you're in a <laughs> modern version of the House of Commons. Uh, we are here to uh, share our different uh, views. Let me introduce our distinguished panel in the order that they will be speaking to us. Paul Cartledge is currently the A.G. Leventis Senior Research Fellow in Clare College, Cambridge and was previously the, uh, and is Emeritus A.G. Leventis Professor of Greek Culture, also at uh, Cambridge University. He is a prolific author and a doyen in the field of classical Greek studies. As such, he has guided his many audiences through the vast and complex heritages uh, that have formed part of our Western civilization. Ancient Greek political thought, democracy, tragedy, uh, as well as works on Alexander the Great, Hellenistic and Roman Sparta, slavery, religion, money, labor, and the land. Reading the publications of Paul, uh, reading the list, I could uh, go on much more. Uh, far too numerous for me to uh, mention. In short, with his expertise, he can uh, guide us uh, very uh, eloquently on the cultural importance of the Parthenon marbles for Greece and the West. Lord Vasey, Ed Vasey, was Minister of Culture in the government of David Cameron. And yes, at the moment, that counts as something like three prime ministers ago, but uh, I haven't kept up to date with today's news necessarily. <laughs> uh, he um, was elected as Conservative MP in 2005, and he remained in the House of Commons for some 14 years. 
He was made a life peer in 2020. And as minister in the David Cameron government, he published the first white paper on culture uh, for 50 years, a telling contribution. Ed is a visiting professor at King's College London and also at Newcastle University. Some of you may well have seen uh, an op-ed he wrote in the Times newspaper just last Thursday. Very interesting, supporting an advancement of the debate uh, in terms of the return of the marbles to Athens. He argued, quote, the understandable decision taken in the UK in the 1980s to refuse to give greater freedom for our national musician, national museums to dispose of objects in their collection is ripe for review. So we can discuss that and related issues uh, later. Last but certainly not least, Dr. Tatjania uh, Flessis is the Associate Professor in Cultural Heritage and Property Law here in the LSE Law School. She holds a BA in Philosophy from uh, Wesley College, a JD from Northeastern University School of Law, and an LLM, and a PhD from the London School of Economics. As I say, her research interests include cultural property and heritage law. Again, she's well placed to guide us, particularly uh, through the issues surrounding, uh, le legal issues surrounding the repatriation of art treasures. After our panelists have spoken, I'm going to invite them to speak for about 10 minutes each. Uh, I'll put some questions uh, to them, but then I'm going to open it up for contributions from you uh, so we can have um, a wider discussion. As you can see, perhaps the discussion tonight is being live streamed and it will also be available as a podcast to download uh, later. Uh, and let me uh, say, so I don't forget, after this evening, if we haven't uh, necessarily persuaded you to shift your opinion, well, in any event, you're invited to join us at a wine reception outside, and hopefully that will um, fuel your uh, discussion much more easily. So there is a discussion, sorry, there's a wine reception immediately outside uh, when we finish. Don't let that inhibit you asking questions. Uh, let me say that it is an LSE wine reception, so I wouldn't wish you to have too high expectations for the quality of the wine we're going to give you, but hopefully it can be a convivial uh, discussion. Uh, let me also alert you to a discussion that is going to take place at the LSE tomorrow evening. And uh, that is also at six o'clock, archaeology and soft power, cultural diplomacy between Turkey and the UK. Uh, as I say, we try to uh, look at all aspects here and all different points of view. So that would be a very nice parallel uh, discussion. So um, that's what we're going to do. This is why we're here to uh, discuss the Parthenon marbles and the wider questions of uh, the repatriation of national art treasures. Uh, let me begin by inviting uh, Paul to speak. Paul, are you going to speak from there? If I may, yeah. Please do. Please Could do. people say, can they hear me? Thank you. Yeah. Your Excellency, Axiotimi Kyrgios Kakiri, colleagues, comrades, I'm being optimistic. Yes. Uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, thanks first of all to my friend and colleague Kevin Featherstone for inviting me to participate in this important event and to join such a distinguished panel. Thanks to all involved with the Hellenic Observatory for making it happen. And thanks not least to you all, my theatron, as the ancient Greeks would call you, my audience. Ten minutes is not a long time in politics, but unlike my two distinguished panelists, I am a Spartan, an honorary one, <laughs> so being laconic comes naturally to me. I am, as I say, an honorary citizen of modern Sparty, but I don't have the good fortune to have been born a Hellene. I am, however, a Phil Hellene, following consciously in the footsteps of Lord Byron 
And for well over 60 years, I've been doing my darndest to make myself as near as damn it to a true Hellene. I started learning ancient Greek at 11, at a school that uh, my fellow on my right knows a little bit about. Modern Greek at 23. I read greats, that's classics at Oxford in the late 1960s. I did an Oxford DPhil in Spartan archaeology and history. I taught ancient Greek history at four universities for over 40 years in all. I am currently, as uh, Kevin has said, A.G. Levendi's SRF Senior Research Fellow at Clare College, Cambridge, and I'm also the President of the UK's Hellenic Society. Last year, I was lucky enough to be made a Commander Taxiarchis of the Order of Honour, an award in the gift of the President of the Hellenic Republic. But in the present context, this evening here, I am, of course, above all else, the Vice Chair of the British Committee for the Reunification of the Parthenon Marbles, BCRPM, and an elected Vice President of the International Association for the Reunification of the Parthenon Sculptures, IARPS. Now, the British Committee is almost 40 years old. It was founded in 1983 in response to the heroic initiative in the early 1980s of Melina Mercuri, then the PASOK Culture Minister of Greece. It's now one of some 19 such national committees outside Greece. But it wasn't the first. That honour belongs to the Australian Committee, co-founded and chaired by Emmanuel Comino, originally from the island of Kithara. He's now 89. And Exhibit A, huh. I don't know if you can see this, but is a shirt which he and his committee design kindly gave me. And um, I believe he's able to make uh, more available if required. It's a hilarious sort of macaronic combination of English and Greek. It suits you extremely well. Thank you. I like it. Now, the IARPS is rather younger than BCRPM. It was founded only in 2005, and it's currently chaired by Belgian archaeologist Dr. Chris Titka. Now, I'm not sure whether I am actually a founder member of BCRPM, but I do remember very well being invited to join through my Cambridge colleague, Professor Anthony Snodgrass, and meeting with the likes of Eleni Cubitt, uh, Professor Robert Browning, and the MPs, forerunners of yourself, but they were on the other side of the house, Eddie O'Hara and Chris Price, giants, all of them. My point is this. I've been actively campaigning for at first the restitution and now the reunification of the Parthenon marbles, all of them, all of them that are still outside the Acropolis Museum, not just those that are in the BM, for almost 40 years. There is therefore no argument, no twist of argument, all of course flawed, that I've not heard for their retention outside Greece, and especially the retention of those in the BM. On the other hand, I've been gladdened and heartened to watch the steady and now far more lively and vigorous growth in support for our reunification campaign over the years. And I'll come back to that. But first, why the change in terminology from restitution to reunification? Now, I'm no lawyer myself, though I happen to be surrounded by them at home, and actually I have one on my left-hand side as well. But it seems clear to me, as it always has been to BCRPM and IARPS, that restitution, the word, has at least overtones of legality and therefore of ownership. And attempts to go the legal route to reunification not only have manifestly failed in, or rather sometimes not in, courts, they've also muddied the campaign waters by raising precisely that red herring. 
by which I don't mean that the legal issue of Lord Elgin's and so the British States and so the British Museum trustees title to the marbles is unimportant. Indeed, I've just been reading in draft a wonderful forthcoming book by a French human rights lawyer to the effect that in international law, the UK probably doesn't have much of a case. What I mean is that we should steer very clear indeed of resorting to legal argument or action in the present and for the future. And I'm going to be very personal for just, just a moment. I was very kindly sent personally by Mr. John Lefas a copy of a 2019 book called Who Owns History by a human rights lawyer I much admire, Jeffrey Robertson, and it's Exhibit B. No doubt, I thought, when I received it, it will be an excellent book. As I can now confirm it is, but at the time I received it, I was so upset by Mr. Lefass's and Mr. Robertson's involvement with legal action that I couldn't actually bring myself to read it. Instead, I clung on all the more fiercely to my Oxford contemporary, Chris Hitchens's The Parthenon Marbles, Exhibit C, which in its 2008 third edition comes with a preface by Nadine Gordimer, excellent essays by Robert Browning on the Parthenon's chequered history, and by the late Haralambos Buras on restoration works undertaken on the Acropolis and off since the mid 1970s. Well, why did I join, choose rather to join BCRPM all those years ago? Why do I choose still actively to campaign? I stress that as an academic, my reasons will not necessarily coincide completely with those of all other fellow campaigners. They are basically two. First, academic slash aesthetic. Second, moral imperative. The context and the manner of the main act of removal of marbles from Athens by Lord Elgin did not then and does not now reflect well on the standing of Britain as a sovereign nation, as Greece in the early 19th century, of course, was not. It is, I think, a shameful nonsense that not only large parts of an original whole object, and I mean the frieze, the unique frieze, remains divided, but that even individual sculptural members still are divided to this day. Members which are not merely, though they are art objects, but they're not merely art objects. They're an awful lot more than that. Then there is the wider, deeper, altogether more problematic issue of politics. Not academic politics, I, I'm very familiar with them, but politics politics, the sort Ed is involved with. Reunification will require, eventually, an act of the UK Parliament, and it behoves us as a liberal democratic polity in an increasingly un- or anti-democratic world to promote soft cultural interstate diplomacy in every positive way we possibly can. To which end, I detect several straws in the wind the latest YouGov poll, the return of Parthenon fragments from Heidelberg and Palermo, though not yet from my own Cambridge, the recruitment of several prominent journalists and even a whole national newspaper, the London Times, to the reunification campaign, the success of the parallel Benin bronzes and other removed or stolen African objects campaigns, especially in France, which is of course no less, once upon a time at any rate, colonial imperial than Britain. The latest, and it was last November, UNESCO resolution on cultural property. There have been a couple of ex-trustees of the BM who have come out and said they now favour the reunification of the marbles. And then finally, not least, 
the Parthenon Project and what I'm going to call its front man, Lord Vasey, whose recent House of Lords debate focusing on the National Heritage Act of 1983 so often and quite rightly emphasised the necessity for us to, quote, do the right thing. Two final points. Parthenon marbles. It really is the return of only the marble sculptures from one particular building that's still on the Acropolis of Athens that the Greek government and therefore BCRPM and IARPS are requesting back. Don't get me wrong, I love much of the BM, though let's be frank, it is to a large extent the British Imperial War Museum. <laughs> but their display of the marbles, the marbles they hold in the infamously named Duveen Gallery, is a disgrace. As ironically enough was brought home to me most vividly by my friend and long-standing Cambridge colleague Dame Mary Beard in her excellent little 2002 book just called The Parthenon. Yes, the same Mary Beard who is currently a BM trustee. I nearly forgot to answer the question posed by this debate. It's a no-brainer. In the, it's now newish, founded, opened in 2009, Acropolis Museum. The clue is in the name. The Parthenon is essentially of, as well as on, the Acropolis. In Athens, in the dedicated Parthenon Gallery of the Acropolis Museum, the Parthenon sculptures that they hold are arranged in the correct way. They face outward, as they have always done done as they were meant to be seen. Their alignment in the Parthenon gallery is accurate. They are bathed in Athenian light and viewed against the Parthenon up on the Acropolis and the Acropolis itself. At night, the glass surfaces of the museum afford dynamic comparisons reflecting the sculptures against the illuminated Parthenon and Acropolis. In the museum and only there, I would suggest, is it possible properly to understand and appreciate the sculptures close to their original environment for which they were of course made, where light, clouds, rain and outcrops of marble all add to the story. Enough said. If you have been, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Ed. Yes. Okay. Ed, would you like to speak to us? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, Paul mentioned in passing, you probably didn't pick up that he and I were at the same school, uh, St. Paul's. So just for those people who aren't British, in the room. This is a good example of how the British establishment works. Um, uh, we went to St Paul's. I'm chairman of the St Paul's Alumni Association and so one of the reasons I ca am campaigning to return the path of sculpture is I will stop at nothing to draw back old poor lines into the fold of the Alumni Association. <laughs> but uh, it's also relevant because George Osborne also went to St Paul's so it's, it's quite a niche little issue sorting out the problem of the Parthenon sculptures, which is really all based in a small school in uh, Barnes. Um, and the other interesting thing is that when um, Paul was referring to the British Council for the reunification of the Parthenon marbles, I wondered if it was the same organisation as the British Council for the reunification of the Parthenon sculptures, which is chaired by a former Liberal Democrat MP called Andrew George, and Paul assures me that they are in fact two different organisations. Both within the international. And we now have the Parthenon Project, so we've got a real people, people's party of Judea problem uh, kicking off. So I think one of the things we should probably do is try and unite the three uh, projects to create a united um, front. Um, so what I really, this isn't a debate by the way, because I think all three of us agree that the yes. sculpture should um, 
should be writing, but I know at least one member of the audience vehemently disagrees with us, so he'll be contributing later in the Q&A. So I'll keep my remarks as short as possible so we can at least um, uh, have a debate. So I was the culture minister in 2010, and I think it's important to say that the Parthenon sculptures are obviously an issue that every, uh, relatively every school child uh, in Britain grows up with as much as every Greek school child, and they are actually woven into British identity in a funny way as much as they're woven into Greek identity. And I think the reason this debate is now becoming so live and so interesting is because it plays into, in effect, the identity crisis that Britain is going through uh, at the moment. Uh, and we are, I think, broadly speaking, in this country, generally brought up to believe that the Parthenon sculptures are ours, that they were legitimately acquired, and that they're very much part of the British Museum, and nobody should countenance uh, returning them. And I think that when Liz Truss was asked about this uh, the other day and her instinctive reaction was to say she's not in favour of returning them, that is the sort of default position that one is brought up with um, in this country. Um, and so uh, I think that's an important point to kind of take on board. So when I became the culture minister in 2010, it, uh, it, it would have taken quite an intellectual effort, I think, for me to get from the default position, they should be uh, part of the British Museum collection uh, and returned to Greece. And um, at the same time, the director of the British Museum was Neil McGregor, probably one of the most articulate and charismatic museum directors we've had for many, many years. And he put a very strong case for retention. And he is a very clever man. And he used every device available. Most of the arguments everyone is uh, familiar with. He, di he didn't just rest on uh, the legality or, or otherwise of the acquisition of the Parthenon sculptures. He talked obviously about the number of visitors who go to the British Museum, but he was also, he also cleverly segued uh, the British Museum into being a world museum. So you can go in two directions. Mm -hmm. You can say it's the British Imperial War Museum, or you can say it's a museum of world civilization, which attracts millions of people from all over the world to see them. And of course, it's not just British people who go and visit the British Museum, at least before uh, COVID. And the third subtle argument he used was that the Parthenon sculptures were no longer effectively part of the Parthenon, but were just works of great art, just as the Mona Lisa is, universal art, and therefore should be appreciated as such and divorced from the structure from where they came. And they are all compelling arguments, which again, one must be aware of. And people have often asked me why I didn't make more of a fuss if indeed it was my position that the Parthenon sculpture should be returned, if I didn't make, shouldn't I have made more of a fuss when I was the arts minister? And my answer to that is really twofold. One is that I wasn't actually particularly exercised uh, about the issue. It was something that sort of nagged at me. It felt wrong, but it wasn't something I gave a great deal of thought to. And secondly, when you're a politician, uh, perhaps not these politicians currently in government, but when you're a politician, it's, it pays to pick your battles. And coming in as the arts minister in 2010, dealing with austerity, dealing with spending cuts, <clears throat> and all those kind of issues that one had to deal with, uh, the last thing I wanted was to have a row with the British Museum about what to do about the Parthenon sculptures. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think it would be wrong even now for any culture minister to be divorced from the position of the trustees of the British Museum, uh, which obviously leads on to the other issue. <clears throat> and it was the issue that I raised in the House of Lords, which is our national museums are genuinely constrained um, by uh, legislation. <clears throat> and when they were freed up to become autonomous institutions, a lot of them used to be uh, subsets of government departments. The Victorian Albert Museum was a part of the Department for Education and Science, for example. When they were freed by Acts of Parliament, the Parliament deliberately put in uh, that legislation clauses that prevented the disposal of any object aside from <clears throat> routine housekeeping. It had been destroyed, they had a duplicate or whatever. So this allows a game of pass the parcel to be played uh, in Britain, where the minister can say it's a matter for the British Museum trustees, uh, and the British Museums can quite, trustees can legitimately say, no, it's not, it's a matter for the government, because even if we wanted to give them back, uh, we couldn't uh, give them back. So that is uh, another issue that needs to be uh, dealt with. And more and more museums now want the power. It, it's a, it's an, a great irony that if Lord Elgin had brought the Parthenon sculptures back and given them to 
Hammersmith and Fulham Council, for example, they could have got back to Greece much more quickly because Hammersmith and Fulham Council or indeed regional museums are not constrained by this kind of legislation, but the national museums are. <clears throat> now, I raised this debate in the laws and Penny Morden, the leader of the Commons, was asked about it by Oliver Dowden, the former Culture Secretary, on the same day that I had my debate, whether uh, asked by Oliver Dowden um, whether she would resist this underhand attempt to uh, take great objects out of our national museums uh, and send them back. Uh, and she took great pleasure in saying yes, that she would. And this goes to the whole issue about cultural identity, which the Tory party is very wrapped up in. Uh, and these, uh, the words you hear bandied around, of course, are sort of woke uh, and things like this. And it's a sort of uh, something they've sort of inherited from uh, the US culture wars. But anyone who gives any thought to this understands that US culture wars are far, far different from any kind of culture war we could have uh, in this country. It's a sort of borrowed political row, which really isn't very British at all. Uh, but the Tory party revels in this, and Oliver Dowden, who is a very good friend of mine, reveled in this uh, <laughs> when he was the culture secretary. He couldn't, be and he genuinely believed it, actually. He couldn't bear the fact that people were questioning uh, whether statues of people who had perhaps profited from slavery or been slave owners, whether their prominence should be uh, questioned, or whether we should indeed question the provenance of objects in our great national collections. And this speaks paradoxically to, uh, it's a sort of bombastic approach, but it speaks paradoxically to a huge insecurity that is now prevalent, as it were, in the British ruling class and British establishment, which is, of course, the aftershocks of empire. The, uh, uh, it's a legacy of Brexit. It's a desire to see Britain as a strong and independent uh, nation that shouldn't be kowtowing to anyone. Uh, it's a belief that we somehow still have a reserve currency, which is why we can have a tax cutting budget without any commensurate uh, attempt to balance the books by cutting spending. Uh, and it's a sort of uh, very, in my view, very sort of crude and unsophisticated uh, approach. Uh, I think we should, therefore, we as a confident nation, we should be very happy to face up to our past history and we should... Um, uh, glory in our triumphs and um, reflect on uh, where we went wrong in the past. And clearly, it's my view that we went wrong with the Parthenon sculptures. Uh, I think Paul is right to say that arguably the, the legal case for ownership is a massive red herring trumped by the moral case. But if you go to the uh, Acropolis Museum and you see the sheared marble where the frieze was hacked off, uh, by Lord Elgin's servants. I think that gives you both the legal and the moral case in one uh, three-dimensional object. Mm. The case for restitution for individual objects is, is often uh, nuanced and subtle. And what I'm advocating, the Parthenon sculptures being the most obvious example, is not that we clear out our museums of their collections, but we look at objects uh, and their provenance and make a considered case. And the idea that there shouldn't be a debate about where an object should reside is ridiculous from the point of view of the British. When the Americans came over a hundred years ago and started buying everything, we set up the uh, reviewing committee for the export, export of works of art, which when you're the minister is one of the best committees to attend because you attend uh, a sort of meeting like this full of scholars like mm. you two, uh, but there are sort of 10 or 12. And it's sort of, uh, those of you who can remember the generation game where there was a sort of conveyor belt of <laughs> household objects. Literally, often objects are brought into the room <laughs> and looked at. And a learned debate of sort of 20 to 25 minutes transpires about whether or not that object is of immense cultural value to the British. And uh, I would then get a recommendation from the reviewing committee to put an export stop on a work of art if it was felt to be part of our cultural heritage. And the, and the deal was that if a uh, public institution could raise the money that say somebody had paid to buy it, to export it abroad, that uh, institution would then have the right to keep it. And I remember once when I was about to go on holiday, discovering uh, that I was trending on Twitter uh, alongside an American pop star called Kelly Clarkson. And it turned out that I had banned Kelly Clarkson 
from taking Jane Austen's wedding ring out of the country. And she had bought it perfectly legitimately for £50,000 at auction uh, in order to get married. <laughs> and I had decided that this was an object of incredible importance to British culture, and she wasn't having it. And she played by the rules. She was absolutely wonderful about the whole thing. And £50,000 was raised by the Jane Austen Museum, and that is where it resides. So we care about our culture, and yet we get shirty and shifty when another country cares about its culture. And then I always hesitate to bring this up as a parallel, because the headline uh, of me saying, Vasey compares British Museum to the Nazis is so easy to write. But we did set up the spoliation committee mm. to return objects that were clearly looted by the Nazis, a recognition that it is possible to look at the... Uh, heritage of an object and how it came into our possession and where we think it was wrong uh, to uh, return it. So we do have a number of precedents that are very easy to adopt. But the point I'm also making is that there are checks and balances. It's not simply down, say, to an individual museum director to wake up one morning and say, I'm going to send that back uh, and nip down to the post office. There should be, I think, appropriate checks and balances uh, and debates about this. Uh, but I've taken a long time, and I just want to finally conclude simply by saying that I think the case for the Parthenon sculptures is unarguable. And the v &A tell me they have 2.7 million objects. They've had nine claims for restitution, to use that word just as shorthand, <laughs> yes. uh, in the last 25 years. The Parthenon sculptures, the reason they are so prominent is because the case is so obvious. They so obviously belong to a particular building. The Acropolis Museum has been established by the Greek government as a modern uh, museum with a, as Paul said, the most perfect way to display uh, the Parthenon sculptures closest to uh, the place from where they originated. And it would be an incredible gesture for the British government to wake up, uh, an enlightened British government to wake up and find a way to return the Parthenon sculptures from where they came. The reason I got involved with the Parthenon project in particular amongst these different organisations is because I think that their approach of a win-win where we would uh, hopefully work with the Greek government to have some objects loaned to us, loaned in particular to the British Museum that rarely, if ever, leave Greece would be an absolutely extraordinary opportunity, which I'm sure the British Museum trustees, when presented with it, would see as an amazing opportunity to refresh the British Museum's collection and attract new and enthusiastic visitors and do exactly what the British Museum has done for 250 years, which is tell the stories of the world's civilizations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Titania. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's deeply interesting. And um, I didn't go to St. Paul, but I'm going to do that. <laughs> you are now an honorary Paula. Yes. I can't, I can't. Well, um, okay. Wesley College isn't exactly a, a sink institution, is it? No, not. Cousin well, of mine went there. Um, could, you put, uh, could you put the microphone slightly closer to you? Um, I um, would like to talk briefly about the roots and the understanding of conflict in this area in order to support the comments of the previous speakers. So cultural heritage law has its roots in the law of war. And um, we see these both in terms of cam campaigns, for example, Napoleon's campaign in Italy. We also see it in terms of legislation. So the one of the earliest pieces of legislation was the Liber Code uh, in America as a function of the American Civil War. We see it in the Hague Convention in 1954, in the UNESCO Convention of 1970. But the problem is that the values that we see in hearing in these legal instruments are themselves confused and confusing because these instruments both think about cultural heritage or cultural property treasures as spoils of war, but also as requiring protection from wartime losses. So at the heart of the law in this area, therefore, there's a contradiction, both protecting and removing, both saving and destroying. Over the centuries, we've seen this dichotomy play out in different geopolitical areas. 
so such as the Near East, the North-South divide in America and elsewhere. We've also see, seen it within nation states, such as the activities of settlers in North America and in Australia. So this dichotomy has several effects. Um, over time, the meaning of war, military war, has on one hand stayed much the same. We can think of the wars in Iraq and Syria and the attempts of UNESCO, the military and other organizations under the Hague Convention to prevent cultural destruction and losses, and in a sense, how very ineffective these attempts are. But on the other hand, the meaning of war, as we think about it in this area, has shifted radically. We now think of the activities of collectors and collection development as war adjacent in some senses, or perhaps uh, gesturing towards a war in themselves. Um, Lord Elgin was only granted exceptional access to the Acropolis because Britain supported the Ottomans against the French in the Crimea at that time. The French and German collectors circling the Acropolis at that time were as anxious to take pieces away. So changing rules applying to collectors and changing ethics statements and provenance diligence on the part of museums also now are seen in a sense as the result of or a movement in this new idea about culture war, cultural war. Um, we also think of contested ownership as representing other more metaphorical but equal equally violent forms of war. So you have a contested object. Um, the culture wars, as both Paul and Ed talked about, are really the interpretive and political wars between what's considered the universal definition of a museum and the various repatriation and restitutionary claims. The challenge that definition. And in fact, just to give you some background, the notion of the Universal Museum came about as a result of repatriation claims in this country. Therefore, what you have is, on the one hand, we are a Universal Museum. On the other hand, we won't give anything away. So really, we're the Universal Museum UK branch. <laughs> um, it's confusing. So yeah. I would like to suggest therefore, that we move away from warlike discourse. Um, as John Steinbeck says in The Grapes of Wrath, how can we live without our lives? How will we know it's us without our past? But as the various preambles and mission statements of countless museums say, what is a museum without its collection? And in particular, what is a British Museum without the strictures of the British Museum Act 1963, which are there to protect and maintain the consent. So the problem that the law struggles with here is that it is a blunt instrument for what's really at stake. We can assign ownership through law and legal instruments. We cannot, however, and we do not, assign value. Um, and the values that inhere in cultural heritage debates are warlike. This is not because both sides don't value these objects equally, but because they, in many cases, do. Um, each side is fighting for their own version of the same values. And these could be, for example, identity and identification of objects of people. The national blood narrative that Melina Mercuri put so brilliantly when she said, these are our blood, this is yeah. our soil. Cultural nationalism, cultural internationalism fed through the anxieties of globalization and the opportunities for museums and for people of new technologies. My belief is that law is not the problem here. And I suggest that we stop thinking about ownership as defined by law and start thinking about identifying and quieting the values that inhere in claims of ownership. When we agree on values, ownership and transmission are easy. I refer you to the Holocaust Return of Cultural Objects Act, 
2009, and Section 47 of the Human Tissue Act 2004, which gives um, the UK the power, UK museums, the power to deaccession human remains. And as an invitation to think about these values as shared values and to stop thinking about law as a solution, um, I'd like to say that there's no shame in giving something back where the taking was contested from the very beginning. And there's no shame in uniting a great artwork. I believe that we would all agree on these points. Writing a wrong does not undercut the values of collection development, knowledge, resource, research, nationalism of the host country. And nor does it cause the requesting country to win a moral victory. What the law can do is use very simple tools of title and transfer and simple agreements about the shared values at stake to move objects across national borders. The rest of the work of culture, culture connects, culture flows, it changes, we argue, we find new ways forward, can continue unabated. So what would a discourse that is not warlike look like? I suspect it would not turn to law in the first instance. And I am certain that we can all um, get there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come to the law aspects a little bit later. It's always endearing when someone denies the direct relevance of the subjects conventionally understood. Um, <laughs> But uh, let me begin with uh, a question to each of you, if I may. Uh, it isn't a debate, uh, but perhaps I could put points which have often raised in the debate. And perhaps I could start with uh, Paul. Um, I was searching and found that the, the Guardian art correspondent, uh, the Guardian is the, the, the Guardian newspaper, one which LSE academics are more or less obliged to read uh, every day. Mm -hmm. uh, the Guardian's art correspondent some years ago uh, wrote, to claim a cultural identity between ancient and modern Greece is spurious. No national identity is continuous in this way for two and a half thousand years. So to say that classical Greek art belongs to modern Greece is to demean the universal legacy of ancient Athens. Indeed, it is to have a somewhat racist view of the classical legacy. In other words, the, bar the marbles belong to humanity. How would you counter that? How why is that wrong? Yeah. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's a point of view, isn't it? But um, to call it racist as opposed to ethnocentric mm. or nationalist seems to me heightened journalistic language. I have some sympathy because I myself am an internationalist and a cosmopolitan and ultimately believer in a world state where such a thing to be <laughs> feasible. It's imaginable. I had the most wonderful graduate student who much better than me, but he put a political theoretical spin on cosmopolitanism as a political theoretical project. And insofar as any claim- I need to meet him. I'll put you on to him. His name's Matthew Edge. And I always think that's absolutely a great name because <laughs> he's on the edge, he's edgy. And his email address used to be edgy boy. <laughs> no, but um, to go back to um, the, the claim, insofar as any Greek government has put forward the request to have all the marbles, not only the ones that are in the British Museum, reunified in Athens on an ethnocentric, nationalistic, um, pseudo quasi racist basis, I would what wish to qualify that I would myself um, be on the same side to some extent, but I think underlying that is a, I think I'm going to be wicked ethnocentric British superiority 
um, mentality, which is okay for us Brits mm. to make claims. And this is going back to what Ed was saying so beautifully uh, in defense of what we have, as it were, regardless of how we got it, what we have and what we claim to have made of it. That used to be a very big part of the British Museum's claim to justification of retention is that I think it's absurd to call them, if Neil did ever actually call them British, you know, as if they'd been transnatured in the 200, but, but nevertheless, yes, they have become part of the cultural um, debate, cultural language, cultural context of this country, there's no doubt about that. But on the other hand, um, to say that the Greek government is not entitled to make what seem to me to be blindingly obvious points, which have become more blindingly obvious since 2009. Remember when I joined in 1983 or four, there was no Acropolis Museum. It was a, a distant dream. And of course, there were many competitions failed. And it was a bit of a miracle that ever an Acropolis Museum was finally built. You know, it had been in the pipeline for a very long time. So ever since 2009, the claim that the BM, at any rate, and of course, the other bits in the Louvre, in Copenhagen, in blah, 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 then they're relatively small. You know, there's a one metope. I mean, the British Museum has a stonking great amount of stuff. And that's why it's constantly the principal target of reunification or restitution or reparation um, claims. So have I answered sufficiently um, that point? But it's a difficult one. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul, very much. Uh, perhaps if I could come to Tichana on the law uh, aspect. Of course, some people argue that uh, Lord Elgin took 12 years to remove uh, the sculptures, and in that period he was not challenged in terms of his legal right to do so, and they draw contrast between, uh, with other cases like the Magdala treasures in Abyssinia, or even the Benin bronzes, which have already been mentioned. They weren't removed amidst um, tremendous uh, war or military uh, conflicts uh, in that uh, particular uh, location. Uh, so there's a bit of a difference. If we we might return the Benin um, treasures or uh, those from Abyssinia because of a sense of decolonialization, this isn't decolonialization. Um, do you have sympathy with that view? Is this me again? No, no to uh, to Titan. I'm sure. Actually, I, I don't have sympathy with that view. I have two things to say. One thing is, as both Paul and Ed have said, these things have to be seen on a case-by-case -case basis. So already the precedential value of law here might be a bit um, shaky, actually. But the second thing to remember is that at the time that the Parthenon marbles were being removed, um, Greece was part of the Ottoman Empire. Mm. And what you had were directives coming from the central government in, in Istanbul to what was then a small provincial city, Athens. And um, the sort of great powers at play, the French, the British, the Ottoman, were all maneuvering on this, on this sort of um, scene. So what a, possibly a better analogy would be as follows. Let's assume for a moment that the Germans had won World War II. And somehow a few years later, even many years later, um, the Americans buy Stonehenge. And very shortly after that transaction takes place, very shortly, 10 years, the English rebel, get their country back and request Stonehenge back. And the Americans say, look, you know, sorry, we bought it. We've got London Bridge, we've got Stonehenge, you know, you can come visit it, enjoy. And they say, but it's ours. And the Americans say, well, we don't know who built Stonehenge. How do we know it's yours? 
We don't know anything about these people and there's no written you know, history and it might as well be ours. So I think that um, you have to be careful about retrofitting notions of what would look like um, resistance, you know, um, onto sort of historical times that are quite specific. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Ed, can I ask you a small question, then a bigger question? The small question, uh, I'm fascinated by what you were saying um, about the received wisdom when you became minister. Sometimes we think of Whitehall departments having a definite view on certain issues. Is the Parthenon Marbles one of those issues where the Department for Culture and whatever had a definite view which an incoming minister was made aware of? I think the answer to that is probably yes. Okay. And it was uh, in keeping with what you referred to as the establishment view uh, earlier. Yes, I can't remember. I think there is actually a yes minister sketch. Involving <laughs> the marbles. Yeah, I, I mean, it would have been a yes minister moment if I had said, you know what, I really think we should give the marbles back. Right. It would have been a wonderful yes minister moment. Yeah. The permanent secretary gently explained to me why I was completely wrong. Okay. The bigger question is that uh, you've mentioned that uh, museums ought to be given uh, the right to decide on the location. I don't wonder, actually, from just a national interest or democratic view, why should we give the trustees of the British Museum <laughs> the right to give away various national uh, treasures? Um, or indeed any of the uh, major museums we have, wouldn't, isn't it right that, it, that this is a decision for Parliament? Well, I think that's a very good point. Um, I don't uh, resolve from it in the sense that that is the thinking behind the uh, legislation, which is that the national museums stand apart from uh, the rest of the museum world. Uh, what we call DCMS sponsored museums in a more prosaic and bureaucratic fashion. Uh, and it is interesting they stand apart when the National Trust, for example, has more museums than any other organisation. And there are also great museums in our cities outside of London and indeed in our cities inside London uh, that have complete freedom to do with their collections what they wish. Now, it is very clear that there are, for these museums, Museums Association guidelines, uh, but they are broken. And sometimes one finds oneself on the other side of the argument. I can't remember, but there was some dispute over a Henry Moore sculpture on Abingdon Green, where I intervened to um, clear up the ownership of it, because one party that claimed ownership was trying to flog it. It may have been Westminster Council, but I hope I'm not doing them a disservice. And there have been plenty of cases of local authorities selling effectively the family silver to repair uh, the roof. So, uh, part of my argument in terms of giving museums the freedom, the national museums, the freedom to dispose of uh, objects in their collection uh, would be to have some kind of stopgap. Uh, at the moment, as I say, the regional museums are subject to the Museum Association guidelines. They break them at their peril in the sense that they can be demoted in the scheme of things. Um, and there's no reason why you couldn't have a, a similar committee to the reviewing committee uh, that would at least uh, review decisions by trustees of major objects. And, it, and, and you would want some kind of a filter. So I think that's important. And the other point I would add, just to come in on, on the earlier remarks, because I was going to bring up Stonehenge. I'm never sure whether it's right to bring up Stonehenge <laughs> or not. But uh, I think that, again, is, a, is an unanswerable point, that one uh, proximity breeds... Um, I was going to say ownership, but, but yes. affects identity. Exactly. And Stonehenge, we know nothing about, literally virtually nothing about the people who created Stonehenge, but we regard Stonehenge as British, just as we regard Sutton Hoo as British, when it's actually probably Viking. So uh, I don't see anything wrong with the Greeks sitting with the Parthenon in the middle of their capital for the last 2,000 years. Shouldn't feel some sense of um, ethno-identity. 
<clears throat> Perhaps we could give them Stonehenge and we'll take this. No, just but good I, call. I, yeah, add a supplement to that. Um, my committee com commissioned some freedom of information uh, work on the uh, BN trustees who are very, very distinguished. Some of them are ex officio, some of them are individually uh, appointed. They all have to be vetted, blah, blah, blah. And we, we wanted to know, among other things, what sorts of questions were the potential trustees mm. asked and of course we were particularly interested where did attitude to ownership retention of the Elgin collection in particular the Parthenon marbles sit well the answer is it's about number five so in other words you ask a number of other questions about fitness for the job and then on an issue of a particular item or shall we say it's many items but bm has eight million objects so i mean it's an item among that that was the one the views on which the committee the panel interviewing wanted to know the answer to in other words it would be very odd now i think were a trustee to be appointed who was of the view of the three of us on this panel now on the other hand, as I mentioned, a couple of ex-trustees, Anthony Gormley and one other, after stepping down, have said that they, well, presumably have changed their mind, as indeed Ed has changed. I hate these people who change their view on they've left. <laughs> it's really disgusting, isn't it? Chopping and changing what we want is stability. <laughs> oh, now who said that today? I <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. We ought to open it up uh, to contributions from the audience. You have microphones in front of you, and as it's being recorded, uh, if you wish to ask a question or make a comment, could you please switch the microphone uh, on? Uh, please, I'd like to begin. Yes, we can. Mm. And I have asked them the question that I'm going to ask. Uh, both of them, but if I may I'll ask it again for the audience to hear it. Uh, what your response was to bring the so called floodgates argument, according to which uh, the reunification of the partner of Marbles would lead to other nations' requests that could risk to empty the British Museum? Mm. Well, the and short answer is the British Museum can say no. <laughs> so. Only the British Museum could empty uh, the British Museum. So, and secondly, the point I made earlier about the V&A having only nine restitution claims. And, and as I say, I think that the reason we're debating the Parthenon sculptures is because they are very much the exception uh, to the rule, uh, rather than, um, you know, you could count really on the fingers of one hand the kind of cultural objects that are currently in, in British collections that are currently high-profile disputes. What do you think would shift the British Museum trustees? Um, well, it's an impossible. I think having George Osborne as chair makes a difference because you've got somebody who's uh, used to kind of working in this kind of environment and understands the art of the deal. Dare I use that phrase? <laughs> <laughs> no. I think ownership is a big problem in terms of getting both sides to agree a deal and if you can find a way for both the greeks and the british to park ownership which i think is more difficult for the greeks understandably if you if by a deal one means the physical transportation of the Parthenon sculptures to the acropolis museum i think that is possible okay Walter, shall I do it? Yeah, well, you know my answer, Yanis. I've given it many times, but just to go back, it's an old uh, hobby horse of mine. The Elgin collection is one thing. There, there are quite a lot of Elgin things in the British Museum. One of them is a caryatid that was hacked. It wasn't in any danger of falling to the ground anytime soon, though the Erechtheon was not as stable as ideally it should have been in the 1800s. And that has nothing to do with the Parthenon. There are four major structures on the Acropolis, the Erechtheum, Parthenon, Temple of uh, Niki, 
uh, victory, and the Propylaia, which is the entranceway. And so Athena was worshipped in two separate temples, and of the two, the more important was the Erechtheion. So in a way, were I, as an ancient historian, to want just one object back from the British Museum, it would be the Caryatid. And if you go to the Acropolis Museum now, and as you go up the stairs, for the first time, you can see them in all their glory because they have their own platform to themselves and you can see them from behind. Now, that's the Elgin collection and the Caryatid is a part of that. The Greek government has never asked for that back. And when I discovered that, I was slightly shocked. And then I realized the wisdom of limiting the case for request to one building and everything that's related to that. Don't spread it wider. British Museum has a ton of ancient Greek stuff. It's fantastically well stocked. Brilliant of all periods. Going back to the prehistoric, and I personally am really upset that two columns from the treasury of Atreus, which were nicked by an Irish milord and for some years were um, displayed in his country house as Elgin wanted the Elgin marbles to be displayed in his country house in Scotland, not originally anything to do with the British Museum. At any rate, the British Museum is only being asked for one set of objects. And so the floodgates issue is utterly irrelevant because nothing else is being asked. Okay, if other people, there are 294 Benin bronzes in the British Museum, the largest single collection in this country. Now, if the government of Nigeria says we want those back, if the government of Egypt says we want the Rosetta Stone, don't blame me. If you see what I mean, I'm asking only with... The... Yeah, but you've just given the government of Egypt the idea. For yeah, <laughs> yeah they already asked for it. Okay. I mean, so... I'll... Tishana. Spoiler alert. Thanks a lot, Tishana. I think it's, um, I think it's, well, I think the notion of a floodgates argument is something that has its roots in law. It's a legal concept. Mm. It means that if you... If you make one exception, suddenly you'll have to make a great many other exceptions. Vis-a-vis um, -vis this kind of debate, it has its roots in 1985 in an article written by Professor John Henry Merriman called Thinking About the Elgin Marbles. I think it's a form of moral panic. As has been said, you know, museums are full of objects, many of which are not returned. And I think it's part of honoring, actually, the, the uniqueness, not just of the object, but of the request that we think about these things as not prone to floodgate kind of arguments. Maybe if there were five examples of the Parthenon frieze, and we gave one back, the other four would have to go, <laughs> but there's only one. And so I think that places it in an interesting position, legally and otherwise. Thank you. Let's, um... yes, thank you. So uh, other questions, uh, comments, please. Oh, uh, yes, your uh, intervention has been um, previewed. Is it working? Yes. yes. Do I need to keep pressing? No, no, it's on. Go. Okay, yeah. Okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much to our host for uh, hosting this uh, fascinating conversation. And uh, I chose the term conversation on purpose because uh, I am very much saddened that this cannot be a debate as uh, uh, you are. Uh, the problem I see here is uh, that basically, there is a distortion uh, at play here. As an archaeologist, as a classical archaeologist trained both in Sicily and in, in, uh, in Athens itself, uh, I, I, I have the luxury of being trained to see the pieces of uh, the ancient world not uh, as snapshots, but uh, actually as uh, um, elements of a continuity. 
stuff that basically goes on and on through centuries, uh, rolling uh, through the ages and uh, assuming new me new meanings, uh, new values, uh, and being sometimes uh, misunderstood, sometimes uh, misplaced, sometimes uh, destroyed, etc. And uh, as an archaeologist, I see the, uh, the, the, the Parthenon itself and the elements of the Parthenon as making no difference whatsoever. Uh, so it's uh, a little bit angers me to see uh, the whole debate on the Parthenon reduced to only one moment, the moment when the Parthenon was actually created. And uh, uh, because as every reductionism, I think that we are uh, losing a lot in the conversation by doing, the, by, by doing so. The Parthenon, uh, we all know, became a church, became an ammunition deposit, uh, became a mosque, etc. And the priest itself has its own life, has its own life that is coming up to us. And part of it retains its life of um, architectural frieds, and part of, uh, of it retains a life as a symbol as a symbol of something that we are storing into a museum because it means something to us. It's an element of our identity. I'm, I, I was uh, fascinated by what Professor Cartilage was saying about not being an, a, 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 a Greek, uh, because actually I'm, uh, I'm siding a little bit more with Isocrates, which on his Panegyricum was actually saying, Greeks are not the ones that share common blood. Greeks are all that share a common culture. And that's exactly why the Parthenon means something to us, because we share a common culture. We are all Greeks in this particular sense. Okay, would you like to formulate the question? Yes. Um, Can I respond to that? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Just give us, a, give us a question in one sentence. I'll be staying for the reception. <laughs> so, um, so my question at this point is, since these things uh, means, uh, mean something to us, and uh, we are not in the platonic world of ideas, we need uh, the materiality of object to actually have a property, it, just to care for them, if only. Uh, uh, at this point, uh, is it logical and rational to make the point about where this place, the, the, these things should be based only on one moment of their story? Okay, thank you. So, Chana, do you want to start? So, I take your point. And there's a great deal that you've said that I really agree with. At the time that Elgin's men went to the Parthenon and started the wholesale sort of destruction, the Parthenon, if you see old etchings, you know, Athens was a small provincial city and the Parthenon was multicultural. There is a West Gate on it, there's a Frankish tower, there was um, an arsenal, there was a mosque, there, yeah. were, um, there was a harem, there are many different things. But a German architect, as part of the Greek War of Independence, and after that, the creation of the new Greek nation state, took the decision to renovate or restore the Parthenon down to its fifth century BC roots. And that's what we have. That's what we have. And now this now iconic ruin looks a lot like the British Museum, like the Bank of England, yes. like the US Supreme Court, <laughs> right? Like a lot of other, like the UNESCO uh, logo. It's become a symbol and to then argue that, in fact, well, but that's just one moment, really cuts against the reality, which is the time for debating what that moment was is gone. And now we can just deal with what we have. That's my view, okay. anyway. Yeah. Paul, do you want to add? No, I was going add? to say something very similar, but me too. Beautifully put. Okay. <laughs> okay. Other questions, other uh, contributions? Please, Anna. Anna. 
Yes, no. the bottom. <laughs> okay. uh, listening to this discussion, there was one mention of trade or exchange or compensation. Mm. And I think about those 8 million objects in the Victoria and Albert and how many are there in the storerooms of the British Museum. But equally, how many billions of objects there are in the storerooms of museums in Athens, which nobody ever gets to see. And if we talk about the top what, 1% of them? Is there really no room for some sharing, for some exchange? And trans transporting the marbles is obviously not an easy task, but might it be possible to start with a much smaller exchange in which Athens sent, let's say, uh, one of, the, of something from, from the Parthenon sculptures, and in return, um, or something from a, another object of equal value. Athens sends the astrolabe from Andy Kithira. Yes, that and is. And the British Museum in return sends not all of the Parthenon models, but some of them. If one could, it, it seems to me that there's complete lack of trust. Yes, you're right. And that talking about exchange, maybe, and sharing, maybe a more plausible way of actually reaching some kind of action. Correct. So that is uh, effectively, you've just done the deal. So we can all go home now, because that is exactly basically what is on offer from the Parthenon project. That is the kind of way forward, an exchange of uh, cultural objects between the British Museum uh, and the Greek government or the Acropolis Museum or the Museum of Archaeology. And you're right about the lack of trust because the British Museum has lent the Parthenon sculptures to the Russians. They trust the Russians more than the Greeks. Uh, and this is, of course, because of ownership, because the Greek government, understandably, in my view, would like legal ownership of the Parthenon sculptures. So that is exactly the kind of thing on the table. More interesting point I want to address is your point about lots of things being in storage, because I, I just want to kind of put that out there as a, without, this is not meant to be rude, but it's a sort of red herring point in the sense that I don't think that one shouldn't argue, the point about stuff being, I mean, I'm obsessed by storage, museums of storage. <laughs> uh, I sold a, a storage site uh, in Hammersmith that three of the museums owned, uh, for which I got 150 million quid. So I don't know why I'm, what I'm doing here, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think stores should be opened up. But the key point is that the museums are research institutes as well as a visitor attractions, that terrible phrase. So when people say, oh, it's, it's shocking that 95% of what the VNA owns is in storage, I say no, because students and so on will be going and studying the, these objects in storage. But um, that's just a, an aside. Oh, I was going to say, uh, BM has 8 million, not the VNA. VNA has, I think, 2.7. 2, 2. Uh, yeah, 2.7. But um, the, the straight answer, I mean, I'm sorry to say this, but it flies directly in the face of and contradicts the, the notion of reunification. So the BM itself has played around, not just as Ed has said, with um, sending one off to St. Petersburg, uh, but also with moving several from the Divine Gallery to the new Sainsbury wing, where there have been two exhibitions, Defining Beauty and a Rodin, exhibition where, yes, Rodin came to um, the BM and he looked and admired um, the marbles that he saw, but the real reason um, for having those moves was to justify that point that Ed made about what Neil McGregor wanted to shift mm. away from reunification, the, no the notion that every marble is in principle separable from every other, apart, of course, from every slab of the frieze, which you've got to take it out of its adjoining frieze block. But um, taking one pedimental sculpture or one um, uh, metope, yeah, that's perfectly feasible and was done. But to me, 
utterly destroys the whole point of what the Parthenon is, was, exactly. and should be. So I'm just saying to the lady there that, um, yes, we should trade, but not on that basis in relation to the Parthenon. And I'll just give one example of what I think and hope one day will be the case. There are a ton of, as Kevin said in his introduction, stunning individual art objects or objects that can be looked at independently as if they were art objects. I make the point the ancient Greeks did not think of art as we do. There was no art market in the ancient Greek world until very, very late in the Roman period, when the Romans conquered Greece as the Ottomans later conquered Greece. So forget about an art market in the fifth century BC, but not so long ago, an astonishing sculpture of Parian marble from the island of Paros, we're not sure exactly what it represents. The uh, dominant view is that some kind of charioteer was excavated in Motia, modern Motsia, in the far west of Sicily. And it was touted around the world before finally ending up in Motsia on permanent display. So I saw it first in Turin. Stunning display in the dark with the light spotlights on it in the round in Turin Museum. Then next I saw it in the Divine Gallery in the middle of all the Parthenon, because it's the same period. It's fifth century, slightly earlier. It's circa 450, 460, as opposed to 440s to 420s. But it looked again stunning. And that is what the Greek government proposed as a future deal, independently of when and where the Parthenon marbles really should be. But just were they to be back in Athens eventually, that would be the sort of thing that would be coming back the other way. Yeah. Um, there are, you know, the question of ownership. This is why I did my PhD on this. It's because someone said to me, what do you think about the Parthenon marbles? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> and like however many 20 years later, um, I'm starting to have a clue about it. And the question of ownership <laughs> is one in which people are fighting for ownership because they feel the same way about the object. The problem with that is that you could have an immunity from seizure legislation which exists for artworks that visit, that cross national boundaries and make them free from seizure from, let's say, heirs or from people that have claims on them. You could do that with sculpture. You could do that with things in museums. You could do that. But when it comes to these sort of iconic debates, no one really wants that. You know, they don't want to come up with a legal solution. What they want is to own the object until they don't want to own the object. And I'm wondering <laughs> if maybe we're getting near that tipping point now. Wow. If already the culture wars, whatever they are, I hate that phrase, um, around statues and around colonialism and around all kinds of other things are getting so big that now, in a sense, it's easier to give objects back. Thank you. Last question, Thank you. Thank you very much for all this question. Uh, I have a brief question, a more of a practical one. So if we really care about having the marvel open to the world, why can't we, using the modern technologies, why can't we replicate them? Even lease hold the great government, so they can hold them for, I don't know, 50 years, 100 years, whatever. And then, how the replicas back at the British Museum? Would that devalue, appreciate the experience of the visitor at the British Museum? Or would that change the legal ownership in some way? And, I don't know. I think all you know, at the end of the day, in my view, the prize is that the Parthenon sculptures go back to Athens and are displayed in the Acropolis Museum. Uh, and between the current position now and that position, there are many different permutations. It is not uncommon. I remember, again, uh, we had a great appeal for two Titians uh, that were being sold by the Duke of Argyle or a Scottish Duke. 
uh, who was selling tuticians, which obviously have no cultural significance to the UK, uh, but we decided that they were part of our cultural heritage and the reviewing committee, the Export of Work of Arts, refused to allow them to leave and they were about 50 million quid. And this was about 10 years ago. And the National Gallery of Scotland and the National Gallery here bought them together and they rotate every five years. So there is no uh, reason why you couldn't say uh, if you returned the Parthenon sculptures to Athens, for the Greek government to say thank you to the British Museum for stewarding uh, the sculptures for 200 years. And in recognition of the fact that sort of what I opened with, they are linked very closely with the identity of the British Museum in a strange kind of way. Every 25 years, you can have them back for a year. Now, that's probably, that's me freelancing. It's probably unacceptable to the Greek government. The point I'm saying is that there is no reason why one cannot, in between those two endpoints, have a greater discussion about what might work in order to get a breakthrough. Okay, thank you. That's a positive note to uh, finish on. Um, to remind you, uh, we're inviting you to a reception immediately outside, and hopefully we can continue the discussion uh, then. But can you please join me in giving uh, sincere thanks to our panel? Thank you very much for this.